Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's event on the role of strategic communications and military decision making. This event is part of our 2021 NATO YPFP NATO series sponsored by NATO's uh, pu Public Diplomacy Division and their co-sponsorship grant. I will be the moderator for this evening. Uh, my name is Raquel. I'm a security and defense officer at YPFP Brussels. And as always, I would like to thank NATO's Public Diplomacy Division for supporting us in these NATO events. Um, tonight, I'm joined by Mr. Thomas Morin Robinson from Strategic Communications Unit, Public Diplomacy Division at NATO. And next to him is Colonel Francois Clement, Office of Public Affairs and STRATCOM Advisor at the Office of the Director General at NATO International Military Staff. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening and welcome uh, to this event. And I'm looking forward to discussing this topic with you. I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about the speakers. Um, Tom is a, a policy and planning officer from strategic communications in NATO's public diplomacy division, where he drafts communications direction and guidance on various issue areas. Prior to his current role, he was a senior strategic communications consultant to NATO's Allied Command Transformation in North Folk, Virginia, where he planned communications around NATO's military adaptations and warfare development. Uh, before joining NATO, he worked at the Paris office of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, where he researched European and transatlantic security affairs. Um, Francois is a colonel in the French Air Force and Space. He has a 31-year career categorized by a wide variety of operational functions, um, experiences in international relations, and an inter-service and allied environment. Uh, he is a graduate of the, at the Staff College and a holder of a master's degree in law and a master's degree in international affairs from Sciences Po with a major in conflicts and security. He has been posted at NATO's international military staff for two years and as a STRATCOM advisor in the Public Affairs and STRATCOM office. Uh, and again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Before I move on to the discussion and to the speaker's presentation, I would just like to give some housekeeping rules first. And I'm sure if you've been here before to our NATO YPFP NATO events, you probably um, know this. Uh, but beforehand, I would like to quickly make it clear to our audience that even though that this event is sponsored by NATO and our speakers do work at NATO, uh, they are here tonight speaking in their personal capacity and sharing their own views, and these do not express those of the organization they work for. All right, so just moving on to the housekeeping rules, uh, we will be using the chat function uh, throughout the night uh, to so share your thoughts, uh, questions to the speakers. There will be a dedicated section uh, for Francois and Tom to answer your questions, but you feel free to ask them whenever you want um, in the chat box throughout the event. If there are any problems with the audio or the video, feel free to let us know. We have a team here backstage that will help us and we will quickly fix it. And uh, also stick around until the end so that we can hear some career advice from Tom and Francois on uh, strategic communications and pursuing a career in strategic communications, which I'm sure is interesting for our young professionals. All right, so getting that out of the way uh, and to get us started, I would like to fully turn over the mic to the two of you so that you can give your presentation on strategic communications and military decision making. The floor is all yours. <laughs> great. Um, thank you so much, Raquel, for, for uh, a great introduction. It's really nice uh, to be here. Um, both, uh, both Francois and I are really, really looking forward to sharing um, a brief overview of, of what strategic communications are like uh, at NATO, how that, how that work progresses um, and what it means for the overall uh, the overall work of the organization um, if we could get the the slides on on screen perfect so uh, I'd like to begin just just with a quick overview uh, you know noting that public communicators are really important gatekeepers for guaranteeing access to trustworthy reliable and current information they really play a key role in communicating that information to our different publics in a credible and transparent way. Now that job has been getting harder. We're working in more and more complex and unpredictable environments, in particular with the rise of hostile information and disinformation. Those are not new challenges, but their scope and their scale has increased. And the concurrent COVID-19 pandemic or infodemic uh, that we've all been going through and I think we're all familiar with is an exemplary case of that. And so in an increasingly contested information environment, we really have to make sure that our communications effectively engage our publics regarding today's security challenges and the role NATO is playing in addressing them. 
And as we do that, it's crucial that our work always uphold and reflect the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. NATO communications are anchored in these values, and they're, they're really at the center of, of all the communications work that we do. So I'd like to begin by covering some of the basics of strategic communications. Um, so I think some members of your audience, particularly those who might be a bit more experienced in security and defense, will be familiar with the DIME spectrum. That's diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. That's a concept often used in defense circles to consider the different instruments through which a state or an actor in the international system can, uh, can project power and influence. So you can see those up on screen. You can see for, for diplomatic, we have things like uh, negotiations, uh, treaties, statements by allies or by an international organization fall into that category. Um, informational or, or information is a lot of the work that, that we do here in terms of strategic communications. The military instrument goes without saying. The, these are the, the muscle moves, the, uh, the military posture that, um, that allies bring to bear as part of NATO and economic, of course, some of the, the trade policies, sanctions, and other, other um, uh, things of that nature. Those are all ways that a state can uh, exert power. Um, if I could get the slide, thank you. And so rather than one instrument alongside the others, information actually cross cuts all of them. And it's both civilian and military as an instrument of power. It not only leverages actions and policies that fall under the other instruments to reinforce communications, but in turn, it also contributes to their effectiveness. So effective strategic communications means going beyond simply explaining a policy or a priority to helping to deliver it. And what I mean by that is really that political and often military success is always dependent on the achievement of an outcome in what some have called the cognitive domain, where you were trying to change thinking about a particular uh, situation or a particular problem. This goes hand in glove as well with the idea that NATO is a values-based organization. Its public legitimacy matters to be able to fulfill its tasks. So if an operation fails or if an operation is seen to fail in the eyes of NATO publics, it may very well fail altogether, altogether because we'll be losing the, uh, that public support. And similarly, if we're trying to communicate to a potential adversary that they might not be, or that they will not be successful in undertaking an action that will threaten or harm us or an ally, or that they will face unacceptable costs if they do try and take that action, I'm talking about deterrence, then we need to be clear, we need to be credible, and we also need to be remaining open to dialogue and putting forward the right off-ramps to de-escalate a potential situation. And a lot of that happens in the information domain. And so strategic communications are an important part of NATO's business overall. So there you can see information cross-cutting on the slide. I'll do one more. Um, but what are strategic communications exactly? I mean, this is, this is a term that is being thrown around more and more these days, uh, especially when it comes to uh, state communications or, or by large organizations. Um, and so, you know, what, what exactly makes communication strategic as opposed to just regular communications? NATO does have a definition for this. Uh, you'll see it up on screen there. Um, and it defines it as the coordinated and appropriate use of NATO communications activities and capabilities. And what that's talking about is the entire range of communications tools that we have at the disposal of NATO. And using them, all of them, in a coordinated fashion, all together. So these can include public affairs, press engagements, um, traditional public diplomacy engagements with civil society think tank events like the one we're doing tonight, press engagements, um, think tanks, uh, work with think tanks and opinion formers, as well as a full suite of digital tools, social media uh, being one uh, that's very obvious. All of these tools need to be used together and they need to be used in support of alliance policies, operations, activities in order to advance alliance aims. And so this definition neatly summarizes NATO strategic communications as a holistic approach to communications and information activities. And there's a couple takeaways here. Um, one, it reminds us, of course, that NATO communicates to support and enable the organization's policies and aims. And while those policies and aims guide our communications work, 
effective policy also requires the coordination and implementation of objective-driven communications in order to achieve their full effects. And again, that speaks back to the role of information in supporting all the other instruments of power. So in an alliance of 30 with various military commands, other entities, it also really means speaking together, and that's, that's the other side of coordination here. And speaking together allows us to be better heard and better understood. For this to work, strategic communications cannot be an afterthought when NATO has undertaken policies, operations, or missions, but it really needs to be considered from the outset of that planning. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass over to Francois, who will cover the core principles that guide how we communicate. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the principle of NATO STRATCOM uh, overarching and apply equally to all political and military activities across the spectrum of peacetime, crisis, and conflict. First and foremost, all activities are founded on NATO's values. As mentioned by Tom, they are enshrined in NATO's founding treaty, individual liberty, democracy, and the rule of law. Each activity uh, is driven by narrative, policy, and strategy. Credibility is a vital asset and may be, it must be protected at all time. Words, images, and action will be aligned and the information environment must be understood in order to achieve desired effects and outcomes. And finally, communication is a collective and integrated effort that is empowered at all levels. I will come back on this later on during the briefing. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Francois. So I'd like to, to spend a moment on the evolution uh, that NATO has seen in its strategic communications. Um, in a public sphere where expertise and institutions are subject to ever greater questions and scrutiny, we've seen a significant change in how our governments, and how NATO as well, communicate. And there's a few key juncture points here I'd like to touch on, uh, especially for the NATO situation. So the first, the first point is, is an overall move that both NATO and, and nation states as a whole have taken, I think, together. Um, we've moved away from what have been decades of passive disclosure of information uh, about the work and activities uh, of a nation or the work of activity of NATO, and we've moved much more towards a proactive approach, which entails reaching out and engaging uh, our diverse publics. Now, this was first um, uh, officially um, noted by NATO in the 2009 summit communique, and so allies at that point stated that strategic communications are an integral part of our effort to achieve the alliance's political and military objectives. There was a uh, backdrop to that, and the backdrop to that was NATO's mission in Afghanistan. Um, ISAF, or the International Security Assistance Force, as it was known uh, then, um, was a circumstance where NATO was facing a challenging operational and communications environment. The communication structure available at that time were divided, they weren't united, um, and the policies and doctrine guiding NATO's work uh, considered communications uh, not from the forefront or not from the, the outset of, of planning, but more so as an afterthought. And when it comes to a large multinational um, mission, uh, which ISAF was, these were key elements to be able to contribute uh, and communicate effectively um, on that issue. So 2009 saw the development of the first ever NATO strategic communications policy. Uh, and that policy recognized the need to, for better coordination between the political, military, operational, and strategic levels of NATO. It recognized the need for better long-term planning and a better use of resources. And most importantly, STRATCOM became integrated with policymaking from the outset. And I've touched on this a few times, and I'll touch that on it again because this is a really crucial uh, point. So this led to dedicated strategic communications frameworks and plans, internal documents that allowed us to coordinate communications better. They integrated mission objectives with communications objectives. They provided themes, focus topics, and communications, uh, well, themes and focus topics for communications, rather, um, and outlined how coordination worked 
to link communication communicators across the alliance together. And so that really, um, really, really improved the way the alliance was able to, to communicate in a timely and coherent fashion uh, under more difficult circumstances. <coughs> So that point um, saw a lot of progress. Um, but of course, just a few years later, in, in 2014, uh, we saw Russian aggression in Ukraine, um, and those events made clear that NATO needed to redouble its efforts in the information space and, and modernize the way that it was communicating. So I think many of your viewers here tonight will be pretty familiar with the events that took place in Crimea in 2014, uh, Putin's little green men, so to speak. Um, and and these, uh, this remains really the par excellence uh, um, uh, example of how Russia used information to disrupt, to deceive, dis delay, and dismay, um, leveraged trolling, disinformation, and was able to smokescreen their own involvement um, in, in that operation. And what was clear is that Russia used information not as an add-on to its, uh, its military strategy, but as a fully integrated element of their overall strategy. And that required a response. So in the 2014 summit communique, Ally stated, we will ensure that NATO is able to effectively address the specific challenges posed by hybrid warfare threats. This will also include enhancing strategic communications. So Russia's use of information confrontation here ultimately led to NATO's military policy on strategic communications. But it also brought several recommendations which NATO has been implementing to modernize its communications and which we're, we're continuing to develop and improve. First, there was a more rigorous approach to objectives and assessment-based planning for communications. How can we really know how our communications are landing? How can we assess how we're doing? Dedicated work on audience research to be able to better understand who we're communicating to and how we can best reach them. A campaigns approach, which created a franchise structure among our allies to help allies in NATO communicate together to our different allied nations. A more coherent brand for the organization, uh, which helped make our, our international uh, footprint more visible and uh, help have more people be aware of the many different ways NATO is con contributing to that security. And importantly, better tools with which to monitor and understand the information environment in order to contribute to early warning mechanisms as well as to make better decisions based on, on input from the information environment. And a lot was done in practice uh, as well to, to give you a sense of that. NATO, for example, used satellite pictures to demonstrate Russia's presence on Ukraine's borders. Uh, we've set up a myth-busting portal on the NATO website called Setting the Record Straight, uh, which tackles some of the bigger myths uh, that often are put forward by, um, by Russia. Um, and we've also taken concrete decisions about the Alliance's military posture, setting up NATO's enhanced forward presence, uh, which is a set of four multinational battle groups in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. And so that kind of practical work, that kind of military posture, is something we leverage quite a bit to make our communications um, credible. Um, and of course, we're continuing to implement and improve on this work today. So if that, I'll pass back to Francois, who will cover the elements of strategic communications and how that all fits into our decision-making structure. Thank you, Tom. Uh, explaining NATO comprehensive uh, stratcom political military decision-making process, I will not get into detail, but uh, you have to keep in mind that NATO considers stratcom in the planning, execution, and assessment of all activities. This coherence providing process is employed from top-level political direction to tactical implementation as depicted in the slide. NATO's overarching political and military STRATCOM policies are approved by the North Atlantic Council, the NAC, NATO's highest decision-making body. The NAC, together uh, with his, its subordinate committees, is also responsible for generating STRATCOM direction and guidance to support specific areas of NATO policy and issues of political interest or implication. The NATO STRATCOM process supports this by providing direction and guidance from NATO political level all to all the way down to NATO tactical level. The STRATCOM direction and guidance helps to foster vertical harmonization of public communications and messages throughout all level of commands. It is an iterative and circular process where lower level planning can, will inform 
higher level direction guidance and vice versa. Next, please, Tom. Thank you. NATO is continuing to improving how it conducts class strategic communications. We will cover a few examples of them. The key products through which the Stratcom direction and guidance is issued are the annual NATO communication strategy, communications campaign guidance, as mentioned by Tom, NATO Stratcom framework, and integrated communications plans on specific issue areas. The enables, this enables commanders at every level to plan and conduct activities that support the higher commander's intent and help achieve the desired outcomes. All NATO headquarters stakeholders, such as NATO PDD, the NATO spokesperson, or NMS Public Affairs and Strategic Communication uh, Office, ensure that the STRATCOM direction and guidance is shared with allies to encourage a coherent approach to national communication strategies. Education and training is also critical to improve the use of STRATCOM. Like any other job, from a tank driver to a cyber expert, effective STRATCOM requires trained and experienced communication practitioners. As an example, NATO has defined recently strategic communication training standards in order to get the minimum level of proficiency for all personnel assigned to NATO operational STRATCOM positions. This should ensure allies who have diverse national approaches to STRATCOM to understand and agree the competency and experience standards required of individuals assigned to serve in NATO STRATCOM position. In the end, its implementation will also increase the capacity of individual allies in terms of STRATCOM. Better information sharing on allied activities is also important. NATO is an intergovernmental organization in which member states retain their full sovereignty and independence. As the alliance operates by consensus, alliance strategy is bound by the extent of the collective will of the alliance members. NATO STRATCOM strives to ensure the cohesion of the alliance message national communications should reinforce NATO STRATCOM wherever possible. Allies are always in the lead of communicating to their publics. They have to the, the most understanding of their own domestic issues and the highest capacities to reach their public. <coughs> Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Francois. Those are all really important points. Now, we've, uh, we've spoken quite a bit to how we engage audiences with communications, and we've spoken a bit to how we remain aligned with policy. But I'd like to, to speak as well to another element of this, which is the work underway to better understand the information environment that we're working in. So NATO um, currently is working on uh, an information environment assessment capability. So that's, that's a capability that essentially leverages data about the information environment to increase NATO's ability to assess its own communications, as well as those of hostile communications actors. And to see how both of those together are landing in the overall information environment. It reinforces NATO's capacity to identify disinformation and hostile narratives. It helps us detect hybrid activity earlier and to establish patterns of behavior in the information environment. It brings together several tools. Uh, social media listening tools, media monitoring, as well as web scraping. And we're also in the, in, the, in the process of developing a prototype big data analytics system really to increase that capacity to analyze uh, larger, uh, larger sets of publicly available and open source data. So that deeper awareness ensures that NATO's communications are better focused and directed. And that will sh help sharpen our existing capacity in responding to disinformation. And it will also help us develop better uh, and more effective proactive communication strategies. Information environment assessments are embedded as part of our, our broader situational awareness process, strategic anticipation, and horizon scanning. So again, that, that comes back to decision making. And that, uh, that information helps facilitate more coherent, better informed, and more agile decision making by, by factoring in realities in the information environment to an overall decision making process 
that's undertaken at NATO. Another thing I wanted to touch on was brand coherence. Um, now, NATO, of course, is, is not a private company, but the brand of any organization is an important aspect as to, to how it is perceived in the public. And NATO is a really large and complex organization. The footprint goes far, far beyond just the headquarters that's here in Brussels. Um, now, NATO has worked to develop a strong and overarching approach to bring coherence and unity to its many sub-brands. And that includes our military commands and our agencies, uh, all of which for a long time have had their own uh, brands that they've been working with. And it hasn't always been obvious that you can tie some of the many different entities that, that do NATO work uh, to NATO. And so our work on the brand has really helped uh, bring NATO's brand, NATO's overall and most visible footprint, uh, to the rest of our NATO entities. And that helps uh, increase public recognition and familiarity with, with NATO and support for our alliance. Um, and that progress is really essential to maintaining uh, the relevance of NATO and ensuring that the NATO brand is, is really more easily recognizable by our audiences. <coughs> now, uh, beyond proactive communications, beyond improving um, our, uh, our decision making and being more aware of what's going on around us in the information environment, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, uh, with ourselves uh, as citizens and, and with the public at large. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of resilience and media literacy here. Um, so building robust resilience in populations over the medium to long term uh, will be even more necessary to enable our citizens to critically assess the information they receive and to be more able to challenge it at the source. That effort includes the need to support our civil societies in, in, uh, in all our countries and to strengthen free, independent, and pluralistic media. So we do quite a bit of work at NATO and, and we work particularly closely with civil society partners to help build that resilience to disinformation among our, our citizens. Specifically, we have a grants program which supports this work through tailored audience-specific projects across the Alliance um, and it focuses on media literacy and other aspects of, of building that resilience to disinformation. We also do a lot of uh, convening, discussions, meetings on that topic where allies are able to come and share their best practice. Um, and we can better spread that through the alliance where, uh, where some of the allies who have done more work on countering disinformation in their own publics um, are able to share, share what they've found and, uh, and we can make that work across, uh, across all our allies. NATO also helps set criteria in terms of baseline resilience requirements that allies uh, adhere to. So that's work that they do on their own side to improve their resilience um, to disinformation and, and resilience in general across many other aspects. But NATO serves a role in, in, um, in building a baseline that, that allies can look to uh, and work towards. Now, coordination really stays at, at the core of all this work. Uh, we're an ally, we're, we're, we're uh, an organization of 30 allies. Uh, that's many voices. We have um, uh, a, a, a military chain of command across the strategic, operational, and tactical level, more communicators, um, and really stronger together is a tagline for NATO. Uh, and the strength of our Article 5 security commitment here really comes from allies standing shoulder to shoulder, and uh, communications are no different. The more we coordinate our communications, the louder our voice will be, the more will be understood. And that's something we work on quite a bit. So we're continuing to grow a franchise communications campaign called We Are NATO. And that's a campaign where participating allies come together to communicate about NATO to their own publics. And we coordinate really closely with them on that. And we're doing that coordination in a wider fashion as well, going beyond allied governments to civil society, to the EU, and to a wide network of partners and key opinion formers across the alliance. That's really a force multiplier to the work that we do and to our communications. And so our ability to be resilient in the face of division, to cohere our work across NATO allies, and the many partners that share our values, that's really what will be determining our success in terms of communications and NATO's success. So uh, we've covered several elements uh, on how important information and strategic communications are for NATO's work. Today's security and information environments have challenged NATO to adapt how it communicates, and the Alliance has responded by taking STRATCOM seriously in how it makes policy and, and how it accomplishes its core tasks. NATO and allied communicators have a big job, but we're well placed to succeed. The NATO story is a strong one, and NATO and allies must continue to tell it right. So we'll stop there.
Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And we'll be very happy to take uh, some of your questions. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Francois. Um, I think your presentation was really comprehensive as for people, specifically for people who are not in strategic communication, sometimes this topic can be a little bit abstract, uh, complex. So I think your presentation really gave a, a, a more broad understanding of what strategic communications is. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to go back on what Tom said regarding uh, strategic communications. You mentioned that strategic communications means going beyond simply explaining priorities and policies um, to helping delivering them. And this uh, ki this brings on, uh, and it makes me want to talk about uh, the leadership, the position of leaderships. So uh, for me, is strategic communications, um, the implementation of strategic communications is important and needs leadership. Uh, and this, this leadership needs to be at all levels uh, regarding leaders and regarding uh, commanders as well. And they should understand and enforce strategic communications and its concept. So my question is, how hard is this for NATO to implement it with you know, a 30-member alliance um, and the lack of political cohesion within the organization? Um, how, how, how hard is this for NATO? Maybe Tom can go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I mean, I, I think there's a couple elements here. Uh, you know, one is is the leadership role that actual commanders play, and and their roles as communicators as well. And uh, another aspect I'm hearing from your question is how does guidance kind of get translated down the chain of command? And I think that part um, uh, Francois can touch on in a moment. But maybe I'll maybe I'll just speak quickly to the role of of commanders. Um, you know, we have some very senior military commanders in the alliance, and, and we have commanders who, who uh, go all the way down that chain. Um, um, and of course, uh, especially in their own nations, many of these people are very visible personalities, and, and they are communications assets. Um, and so this is something we leverage in our communications. Um, just like the Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, they have a role to play as spokespeople. Exactly. And so uh, often, especially if you're undertaking a large military exercise or operation, you will have, uh, you know, what is what is uh, called in the profession a, a distinguished visitor's day, uh, where where you know some of our key commanders mm -hmm. and, and some of our um, uh, key senior political people come together. And I, I think it's important to note that they come together and to really to stress the political military aspects mm -hmm. of this communication. So. Uh, um, there's both always a military message to send and a, and a political one. And so often you'll have, for example, uh, the Supreme Commander of Allied Powers Europe, Sakur, uh, who's an American general, um, uh, you know, um, uh, come and say a few words at a major NATO exercise. And that kind of stuff helps underscore the importance of the exercise. It helps make clear the objectives that that exercise might be trying to mm -hmm. pursue. And it also amplifies uh, the impact of the communications. You know, we have a louder voice uh, doing it. So, so commanders have that role to play, and they play it down the chain of command uh, as well under under different types of circumstances. Now, another aspect of your question is, you know, how do we remain aligned? We have thirty allies. We have all these commanders. We have uh, all these exercises. You know, how how do we all end up saying the same thing? And I think uh, Francois, you had a couple points um, about how political guidance ends up getting translated into communication guidance and, and military guidance. So maybe I'll pass over to you. Yes, uh, close coordination at all level is vital um, in order to ensure an understanding and Im implementation of STRATCOM as part of achieving overall success. All actions, kinetic, it means the use of force on the kinetic have an, eff an effect and impact on the information environment, either in a positive manner uh, by closing the say do gap or negatively uh, through contradicting our own communication and information activities. So uh, STRATCOM is therefore from the start um, of, the of any planning to be included at every stage of operational planning, synchronization or execution through a staff function uh, including other relevant branches uh, such as electronic um, warfare or cyber uh, space operations or the civil uh, military corporation to mediate any uh, any un unexpected events that could undermine our strategic communications and bring some undesired effect 
um, risk analysis is a key point is essential to uh, and will be constantly implemented through uh, a battle rhythm made of regular working groups and boards. Um, therefore, as described by Tom previously, monitoring and assessing the information environment is critical to adapt our information activities to achieve our strat com communication strat objectives. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Francois, you, you talked about um, how Stratcom is considered uh, the, um, considered in the planning, execution, and uh, assessment, how you just mentioned it. And um, that has a uh, strategic in itself, but what happens when there are challenges in uh, the military, when, when military faces um, a challenge in the operation environment specifically, um, how, and, and that challenge itself will undermine strategic communication, how does the military work around it? What is the decision-making process when that challenge arises that compromises the strategic communication in place? One of the key uh, issues uh, that you have to keep in mind, as a political organization, it's always uh, we need to get a political guidance and direction from the NAC. Then it will be uh, to the um, chain of command, all the military chain of command, to translate the those political guidance to um, basic let put this way basic orders just to face and to address the situation on the ground the question behind this when something wrong happened on on the tactical level so we do have um, um, emergency procedure like put this way but in advanced uh, we have during the planning process we need to think about what kind of risk we could face and then to get a, a plan B, uh, from just to, 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 sh to say shortly. And then um, when there is a gap, at least uh, every time the commander has to re request to the higher command, chain of command, some guidance um, in order to uh, address it correctly um, and to, um, to, to translate, as I say, the political guidance. But first, keep in mind, all the uh, direction are provided by the by the NAC, by the uh, the, uh, the, the nations. Okay. Wonderful. Wouldn't mind adding adding a, a point on that. And I think uh, Francois's point about you know chain of command, political guidance for when you know big serious issues uh, crop up is is really really a crucial one. Um, and I think Francois touched as well on uh, prudent pre planning, contingency planning. And I think if really there's an area of expertise for the military, it is doing that kind of work. And so when an operation is undertaken, uh, a huge amount of, of time and attention goes into considering contingencies, planning, um, and, and that planning is based on that, that NAC advice. And I think as well, um, when it comes to being able to move quickly, uh, Francois also spoke to, to you know, some of the, the, uh, the, the crisis measures that we have uh, ready on the ground. If you're thinking of more, say, operational communications, if NATO is undertaking uh, you know, a larger exercise, a uh, significant mission, uh, what we'll have often deployed um, is a media operations center. And so that, uh, that function allows us really to accelerate um, crisis communications. It, it allows us to accelerate contacts between um, uh, between communicators on the ground uh, all the way up to our spokesperson, for example. And so, so there are those, um, uh, those, those mechanisms in place as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there are a few questions from our audience already, so I think we will move on to the Q&A. But beforehand, I would like to quickly remind our audience in case um, someone connected uh, after the event started. Uh, I would just like to quickly remind everyone that our speakers do work at NATO, but uh, they are uh, here tonight speaking on their personal capacity and uh, their views do not express those of NATO. Um, and so I would like to move on to the Q&A. And I have a question here from Louis. He says, how do strategic communications play into military operations uh, before, during, and after the operations have been completed? And um, what were some of the challenges, for example, when communicating about the withdrawal of, of Afghanistan? Um, so let, let's start with before, during, um, and after. Uh, so I think we've already spoken quite a bit to the planning process. 
that planning process, you know, begins with a political decision at the level of the North Atlantic Council. Allies come together, they, they decide, okay, you know, there's a given security circumstance here. We're all in agreement that we need to do something about it. That's a consensus decision. That decision will be tasked to our military colleagues to come up with a plan. Now, there'll be an amount of political guidance given to how that plan should look, what that plan should take into account, what kind of options are available, wh what's on the table, what's not on the table to accomplish a certain, um, a certain objective through an operation, a mission, or, or, or what have you. As part of that political guidance, there will also be communications guidance. So uh, again, I've said this a few times in my presentation, but really at the outset um, of that plan where you'll get a kind of political statement from, from the NAC that tells the military how they should be doing that planning, part of that how will be strategic communications implications. We'll get some advice from the allies about, you know, what should be put forward, how NATO should be, uh, you know, communicating this. They give broad strategic advice, you know, uh, and that is translated into planning, both on the military side, both on the side of the international staff uh, and the international military staff. Um, and so the before is really a planning aspect. There'll be an aspect as well where, you know, the information environment will be considered um, as part of that plan. You know, what are the realities we're seeing there? How can that guide our communications approach? Um, we'll work on, uh, you know, a coordinating document. Uh, I, I don't want to get into terminology, but we spoke about frameworks. And this is something where we'll consider alongside the military objectives. What are our communications objectives out of this? What are the main themes we're going to be putting forward? What are the focus topics, the specific, you know, uh, more catchy bits about this operation that we want to convey to the public? And, um, and, and, you know, how are we going to measure whether we're successful? So that would be the before. Um, the, the during is implementation. The during is the communicating. Exactly. And the during, you know, depending on what's going on, can be a very short period of time or it can be yeah. a, a very long, protracted period of time where there will be chances to come back on the work that we've done, to assess our communications, to tweak them. But that during would involve, you know, activities with the press, uh, work on op-eds, engagements with think tanks, uh, your commanders on the ground might, might be doing activities, we'll have social media, everything you'd be familiar with that is communications activities. Um, and then the after, well, you know, the after is always a time for lessons learned, to consider um, uh, the implications, what worked, what didn't work, how can that improve our communications, in another specific operation or mission or situation like this, and how um, uh, you know how can that inform our work more broadly speaking? Now, of course, there was a question there on Afghanistan, um, and this was a really, really challenging uh, example of the end of a very long mission for NATO, um, and um, you know one where the communications environment was really, really challenging. And I'm not going to speak to the political aspect or, or the, the, the what, but uh, it's not exactly a perfect example of, of after, you know, a nice tied up of a bow uh, event and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, let's, let's, let's see, what, see how we did. But that is a big part of it. I mean, so there was an aspect of communicating how that drawdown was happening factually. Uh, that was a huge effort and something our communications needed to make clear, transparency. Um, and there was a, a big effort of, you know, being clear-eyed and considering uh, the lessons learned. So that work, that work is still ongoing, and that work will inform our communications as well. So, you know, I think even, even in a particular difficult circumstance like Afghanistan, uh, you know, you'll see that planning, implementation, assessment, uh, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, for um, for our next questions, uh, let's try to uh, keep our answers a little bit uh, shorter, so we can ask, uh, so we can like ask as much questions as we can. Uh, but for our next question, Maria asked, in today's world where information spreads really fast, the environment constantly changes, and fact checking lags behind. How important is it for strategic communications to be reactive? Um. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the reality of the information environment that, that we're working in. Um, Fact-checking is, is an interesting part of communications work. I would actually preface a question on, you know, how important is it to be doing fact-checking? How important is it to, to get out right up front and, and say something immediately? I mean, what we've found with disinformation is you, you knock one thing down 
and you know, 10 other stories pop up. There's a great uh, Rand Institute report about this that was published a few years ago, and the metaphor that they used was a fire hose of disinformation. And so um, it's important to note that not everything requires necessarily addressing. And part of that work means using our information environment assessment capability to sort of, you know, do a bit of triage there and say, okay, you know, what, what, is this really impactful? Because when you start addressing everything, what you can also do is bring those hostile messages back to your own audiences. There are certain things that may be sitting in a rather small um, um, pool of, of people and, and, you know, by flagging it up to the level of an international organization, then in a certain way, you are amplifying that. Um, now, when it comes to, say, the operational level, you know, NATO does have an approach for this, and it's really an understand and engage approach. It's one where we use, like I said, that information environment assessment capability, and then we use that to make that decision. And another important aspect of that is coordination. You know, if it's operational, if it's happening during uh, a mission or during a deployment in an allied nation, that ally needs to know. And we need to decide, you know, is it the ally who should respond first uh, or, um, or what? So, so I would just quickly summarize that by saying, you know, often ensuring you have a consistent, clear, proactive communications narrative is more important than making sure you're, you're getting right up front and hitting every single uh, instance of disinformation. Wonderful, thank you. François. And one of the key issues is also that the, um, nowadays, um, disinformation and misinformation messages count for about 10% of the total information available, but they receive 50% of the media coverage. And for us, or for any uh, organization or states, to put st uh, straight um, the um, into um, at least to uh, to uh, yeah to, to put straight um, the the the, um, the fact, it's quite very uh, challenging uh, because you are only get at, at, at one stage 50 percent of the um, coverage uh, media coverage available, um, so it's uh, quite very challenging for us. Thank you. Um, our next question is also from Louis, and he asks, maybe Francois can uh, go first. Um, can you expand upon some of the challenges or opportunities that exist with working together as 30 nations, but how each ally works to adhere to strategic communications of NATO individually? As I uh, try to explain uh, at, at the end, it's the nations to decide how they are going to address this because um, NATO cannot speak to our on, on behalf of the speak on behalf yes. of the all the thirty nations as an organization, but don't speak on behalf of of Belgium or, or, or the Netherlands. So um, there is a very close coordination between uh, the national um, representatives in charge of the communications and NATO uh, headquarters, especially the uh, as, uh, as a spokesperson, just to amplify and to um, to get in uh, to be on the uh, same track and not to um, and to avoid any discrepancies between the alliance and the nations and i would i would quickly add to that and you know francois as as you've said the really the the originator of a communications approach will will happen up at the level of 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 the NAC. so allies will already be you know meeting daily to discuss issues and communications will, will come into those discussions. Mm -hmm. So 30 allies, that's a lot of allies, um, but NATO is really unique in being that platform for generating consensus every single day. Uh, so that, that really makes coordination uh, easier. And then, you know, uh, we have these formal documents where that guidance gets turned into frameworks, plans. When we've completed those at, at a staff level and we've, we've spoken to allies, shown them our approach, made sure that they've got the buy-in, we circulate those documents to all the allies. And so they have uh, a song sheet, if you will, that they can refer to, and that helps us keep, keep us coordinated. Now, you know, allies will run the communications nationally that they want to run, but they will have a clear sense of, mm -hmm. of what the NATO line is. Wonderful. Um, also, we were talking about strategic communications in general, and uh, there's this, you know, idea now, nowadays, how 
public figures um, take a political stance nowadays, especially in U.S. politics. And Matteo asks, how can the use of public figures contribute to delivering an organization's communication? And is it something that NATO uh, does? I remember Angelina Jolie's visit to NATO in 2018, probably the only I remember. Um, so would you care to extend a bit on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great... That's a great question. Uh, now, NATO has many audiences. We, we have the 30 nations, but we have people of different age groups within the nations, and we have people who know more or less about NATO. What we've often found is we have younger people who, who tend to know a bit less. And we have some ways of communicating that are really effective at reaching some of our audiences. You know, we have these, these videos of, of tanks or of artillery practice. The, a lot of people go wild for these on, on Instagram. They're very effective, but they're not effective with every single audience we're trying to get. Um, and here's where work with, you know, um, influencers, maybe if you will, public figures, uh, can be a, a good tool to break through into new audiences. Um, now, we, we had an example recently, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I mean, Angelina Jolie, of course. Uh, we, we also had um, a, uh, a, a sort of... Um, um, Nordic uh, uh, military, um, uh, 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 you know, a soldier who also was an Instagram model, um, and uh, he again was very, very effective at driving a lot of engagement. Um, and so, I, I think you have to allow yourself to find out in different nations uh, who is driving a lot of conversation. Um, is there? communications approach or their message right for NATO. And here we had a soldier, you know, who was participating in NATO exercise who also happened to be very popular on Instagram. And so when we can find those people, and they vary from nation to nation, they can be really, really great Best communications tools. Ab absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, I Changing the topic a little bit, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about climate change. And, uh, you know, as COP26 recently came to an end, uh, NATO Secretary General pushed to make uh, climate change issues more central to NATO. Um, however, you know, it is spoken about that military operations are often seen as contradictory to uh, climate change in itself and also advances environmental degradation. So can you tell us a little bit about the communications aspect on the military's effect on climate change and this controversy that, you know, a lot of people discuss? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, yeah, the controversy, you know, is there. Uh, that controversy speaks, I think, to a, a communications controversy as well, where um, we want to speak to what NATO is looking at doing on climate change. We, we want to speak to, you know, uh, assessing uh, impact. We want to speak to the ways that NATO can improve or help allies improve their equipment. Um, and at the same time, we have other audiences uh, that, uh, you know, need to, need to hear that, you know, NATO is, um, you know, militarily effective. We want to assure allies that we're able to do our job. And so there's a balance there to be struck. So that's, that's a communications challenge. Um, but it's also a really great communications opportunity, issues like this, climate change in particular. And that speaks back to reaching younger audiences. And I think you see it in climate change. You see it in other uh, issues that have been brought forward that are uh, being taken towards the next uh, NATO summit in June towards the strategic concept, emerging and disruptive technologies. Uh, for communications, these issues can be uh, really great launch pads to reach into new audiences. A lot of our publics care about climate change. They want to know, uh, you know, how NATO can help. Um, and our communications are a way to uh, reach into those audiences and then get them interested, get them aware, get them to understand NATO as a whole and some of the other work that we do. And the same is true, say, for example, of emerging and disruptive technologies as an opportunity to communicate more with, with industry, for example. So we see those issues also yeah. really from a communications perspective as an opportunity. Wonderful. Uh, Francois, maybe from a military point of view, would you care to add a little bit on the topic? Climate change, yeah. Uh, it's, for, um, it's a very tough issue. Um, when you t try to at least... Um, not at least, when nations decide to cut their greenhouse uh, uh, gas emission by, I don't know, 10 or 25 percent. I don't know the, the number, uh, the exact numbers. But what does it mean for the operational and the military missions? Do we need to cut by 25 percent the, the missions? Are we are executing or exercising 
our uh, troops? I don't know. It's uh, at, the, at the end, it will be to the nations to decide how they are going to translate their commitment to the COP26 in real um, actions. So um, it's uh, very kind, very b not burning issues, but very sensitive for our for all our citizens. Um, and at this stage, there is no concrete um, detail how they are going to implement this. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, um, I know we could uh, have many questions here to to ask, but I think we were going to have to wrap up. But before we do, I would like to quickly ask Tom and Francois if you could, in a short sentence, if you could maybe give an advice to our young audiences. Uh, they are young professionals, students, uh, and they want they are interested in these topics: security, defense, strategic communications. So maybe to give one short piece of advice into, you know, uh, pursuing a career in this. Maybe Francois? So I will give you uh, two pieces uh, of advice, two pieces of advice. The first one is to try to be the most uh, geographical mobile. Don't be afraid to be, uh, to, go, um, to, to go abroad, but most especially go on the ground, go in the field to at least to give some roots really deep roots of your knowledge and experience. To get academic point of view, diplomats one thing. But once, if you get real life experience, it will matter at one stage. And the other piece will be, um, you are competing, you are competing with each other in very, um, uh, uh, in the foreign policy or foreign affairs. You know, a lot of them, a lot of, the, all, all you, of you will try to get a job in any organization. What makes a difference, you have to at one stage to get an expertise on a specific areas, and this will make you different uh, compared to the others. And, try and you could uh, assume get um, a better chance to get you on what you expect. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, that's uh, great advice, uh, Francois. I think absolutely, uh, you know, taking opportunities to uproot yourself uh, when those opportunities present themselves uh, is really valuable and that, that can help differentiate you and, and get you the kind of skill sets that are uh, hard to come by um, elsewhere. Um, and on that, I would say, you know, my, my personal uh, line of thought is this, is when you're presented with a challenge or an opportunity, and uh, it, it looks challenging, or you're not quite sure if you're up for it. Uh, I, I would always, always take those shots. You know, work extra hard, make it work, uh, and then you have yet another story, more confidence, um, and uh, and and that's that to me is is just excellent advice. I would I would build on Flosso's point of specializing, with also not not being afraid to take an opportunity when it presents itself, because I think. There's topic specialties, but there's also specialties of working in a large bureaucratic international environment. And whether you're working on communications or whether you're working on cyber, yes, you need to specialize. Yes, you need to develop that expertise. But the ability to operate in an environment like that, to work in an environment like that, is a specialty in and of itself. And so when you have the opportunity to do it, and maybe it's not exactly you know, the, the perfect thing that, that you want to do, uh, I think it's really worth thinking very hard um, that that might be a good opportunity to take. Wonderful. I think those are great advices and our young uh, audience really appreciate it. And even we are young professionals in foreign policy. We really do appreciate each advice that we get from our speakers. So uh, Francois and Tom, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being here this evening and for talking to us about strategic communications. It is definitely a topic that, you know, at first seems very, very complex. But once, you know, you talk about these things, it gets quite um, easier to understand. So thank you. Thank you for uh, that presentation, which helped us a lot. And uh, I have a couple closing uh, matters, but um, I would like to thank once again NATO's Public Diplomacy Division for uh, sponsoring this series of events. Uh, I would like to uh, mention that we are going to post a link for a feedback on uh, these events. So please, we appreciate your feedback and we appreciate uh, you filling out this form. It really help us. And if you are not yet a member, you can become one. Uh, today we have a special 50% discount for membership fees at the moment. So we will post that link as well. You can go there and 
uh, do the checkout. It's quite simple. And um, as well, we have many of events coming up next year, especially from our security and defense team. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram at YPFB Brussels. We still have a few more before the year ends, but many things planned for uh, 2022. Uh, once again, thank you, Tom and Francois, for coming today. And I wish you all a good evening and stay safe and good night.